everybody. Welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me, as always, are my fabulous co-hosts. Hey, Rob, it's Diana. And it's me, Jackie. Hey, guys. I'm excited today. I'm excited. Do you know why? Why, Rob? Well, because we're going to do something a little different. What is it, Rob? Well, typically our format on this show, if you're new to the show, is we pick a topic related to the field of behavior analysis and we discuss behavior analytic research. This week, we're going to do something like that in that we're going to be talking about the very important topic to behavior analysis and to most fields, which is ethics. But instead of doing research articles related to it, we're actually going to be talking more specifically about ethical scenarios as featured in a uh, newish book that has come out. What do you think? Wow, Rob. This is the first time I'm telling you this plan. <laughs> I'm like very excited about this. You sound so excited. So we thought, you know what? It's a lot of fun. We, we all got a chance to look through a workbook of ethical case scenarios in applied behavior analysis by Drs. Uh, Darren Sush and Dr. Adele Najowski. And that came out, I think, spring, last spring, last summer. So yeah. it's not, not too old. And it is a great book that includes tons and tons of ethical case scenarios, which one probably always needs because there are so many different ethical codes and we all haven't been impacted by all of them. And then we thought, you know, it would also be really good because it's really hard to come up with the answers to these ethical scenarios. <laughs> what if we talked to one of the authors? And so we are very fortunate that we're not only going to get to talk about some of the specific case scenarios in this workbook, but we're going to get to talk about them with one of the authors, Dr. Darren Sush. So without any further ado, let's bring him on the phone. Darren, thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. We are so excited to talk all about ethical quandaries and ethical scenarios. Yeah, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Before we get into the book itself, why don't you tell all the listeners about you, about your career, where, where you're currently teaching? I'm a, uh, I'm a licensed clinical psychologist here in California. Uh, I'm also a BCBAD, and I've been working in the field of behavior analysis and, and as a psychologist or in the field of psychology for a little over 15 years, I guess. And, and uh, within that, I've had the opportunity to work in uh, a number of different settings in the home, providing direct treatment, mostly for, for young kids, but also some adults diagnosed with uh, autism spectrum disorder. I've also had the opportunity to work in school settings as well as in inpatient. And I also have a private practice where I provide therapy, talk-based therapy for parents of children diagnosed with autism. And I'm actually, I'm a professor. I, I teach a couple different classes at mainly right now with Pepperdine University. Uh, one of the classes that I uh, love teaching and have the great opportunity to teach is the ethics course, which is, which is fantastic, which is uh, really where one of my biggest interests lie. Darren, you sound busy. <laughs> yeah, why don't you write a book? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> yeah, you know, with all that spare time I have, just write a, write a book or something like that. Sounds like a good idea. <laughs> how, how did you get interested in ABA? Is that too personal a um, Oh, no. It's, no, I, I love that question because I love talking about that, especially with, with students. One of the great things about teaching, uh, a lot of the classes that I teach are with the students that just start within the program. So I get to hear all their stories about how they even found their way into a, a master's program focusing on behavior analysis. So it's always nice to kind of think about and reflect on how our stories are similar and also how they're a little different. But my story kind of, I guess, started, I, I was getting my doctorate in psychology and I knew what behavior analysis was, I suppose, but as you would imagine, most general clinical psychology programs, they kind of say, there's behaviorists, they exist, and there's this guy named Skinner, and he did some stuff, but they don't really go into it too much as far as what applied behavior analysis is and how it's utilized, so I didn't have as much experience, and in a lot of clinical psych programs also, they they have their one day, kind of their one course related to autism, so my understanding of uh, ABA, my understanding of autism was, was fairly limited before I started. So it wasn't really the direction that I saw my career going. But when I was in school, I, I wanted to get some work experience as well. And one of the jobs, at least at the time, that you can get without having a lot of letters after your name was working directly with kids who've been diagnosed with autism. So I, I went into it basically looking to get some work experience and looking to learn and I, I guess I was just really fortunate. I, I worked with some really amazing families. I, I got to work with some fantastic kids. And the more that I had the opportunity to to work 
adjacent to this field, the more I understood how much I really loved it and I wanted to get more invested and more involved. And I, I basically just kind of grew from there and, and completed my doctorate in clinical psych. But then after that, continued working within the field of applied behavior analysis and gaining more experience and moving up and eventually gaining the, the BCBA and BCBAD. And it kind of progressed from there. I love that. I love that discussion. And I think that really relates to how, you know, you've spun around to ethics now too, right? Because ethics is one of the, the common threads we have, I think, with psychology. I, I think I agree with my, you know, my colleagues that are psychologists and not behavior analysts and are teaching all of the, the undergrad psych students. We have that one commonality that we all agree that ethics are important and, <laughs> and we may not agree on a lot of other things, but we're still friends. And that you found us right. through where you were. I think that's awesome. Yeah, somehow that path kind of led me here. And, you know, I think now I'm a self-admitted nerd when it comes to <laughs> when it comes to ethics and behavior analysis. So but that Jackie. certainly... Yeah, me too, Darren. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. So that, Yeah, and I think hopefully... And there's a lot more of us, I think, especially with the last five to ten years or so that are that are coming out of the woodwork. But I definitely wasn't for a very long time. I mean... My, my coursework that I remember in my, in my doctorate and even in my behavior analytic coursework, you know, ethics was kind of the class that you had to take. And it was, I hate to say it, but the hoop to jump through, but I didn't really find it to be an interesting aspect of this field. I found it, I found at least the study of ethics or talking about the code or then the guidelines. I, I found it interesting enough, but certainly not an area that I wanted to dedicate any more focus to beyond, I guess, this is something that I need to know. But the more that I learned about ethics and behavior analysis, and it really was when I started teaching uh, and teaching ethics and behavior analysis that I started saying, wow, this can be a really dry subject where we just kind of talk about the code, talk about the shoulds and shouldn'ts, the rights and the wrongs, and get very black and white. And then, you know, we could all just kind of go about our day or we can make this a really worthwhile and meaningful discussion. Mm -hmm. And really, from, from the students that I had, this is where kind of my interest in ethics grew even more. It kind of was a little bit backwards in that I started teaching it and from the experience of the students and them asking questions. I started really understanding there's so many more doors that can be open to in understanding ethics in the practice of behavior analysis. Mm -hmm. Darren, when you were when you were working with uh, with Dr. Del Najowski in writing <laughs> in writing your book, was it a concerted effort of we don't just want to write just like an ethics book? It was we want to do scenarios specifically, or were you sort of you know workshopping what ideas of how you'd present new material, and you kind of fell upon the idea of doing the multiple scenarios? The birth of the book was always this is going to be a case scenario book from the from the start, mm -hmm. and and again that really came from from my students because what I found was that what I like to do is I always I always try to put things whenever I'm teaching whether it be a concepts and principles class or an ethics class or things like that I try to take the behavior analytic jargon and then put it into what I call human speak mm -hmm. so something that's understandable and translatable so the students can connect with it a little bit more. And then that way they'll have the terminology, but also a little bit more in-depth understanding of what it actually is that we're talking about. In talking about ethics with my students, we started getting into more, they would bring in more questions from, from their work experiences in the field or things that they've discussed with their supervisors. And I found that if we're just going to go through the code line by line, even if we're trying to translate it into something a little bit more digestible, it's really insufficient and boring. also not as yeah and boring <laughs> frankly yeah yeah exactly uh, me i i also teach ethics and those days where there's no exciting scenarios or role play situations i'm like oh am i gonna fall asleep yeah, right. while teaching this <laughs> <laughs> right right exactly so that so that's kind of where i started thinking about putting the book together was really because I was integrating in more case scenarios, whether it be from my experience uh, within the field or my colleagues' experience or the ones that my students were bringing up. I was using that more and more to kind of put the code into context. So it's not just, this is what the code says, so do it. Or this is what the code says, let's not do it. Because that's not meaningful once you actually get out there mm -hmm. and you start practicing, especially right. if you have to practice on your own. Mm -hmm. So the scenarios were a way of kind of connecting and, and learning about the code and understanding it in a, in a way that's actually functional. I, I mean, I certainly appreciate when there are ethics talks that are more like ethics mini stories 
I don't think I understood mm-hmm. how complex ethics could be when it was sort of here is the code and you must follow these things because you try to think of an example or two. And most of them, especially when you're starting out, is like, I'll never have this problem. So I don't need to remember this code. <laughs> it's not relevant to my life. And then right. only later on when you've either unfortunately had such a scenario happen to you or you've heard about someone else's horror story or you've gone to enough ethics talks where someone finally is like, I'm going to actually tell you scenarios or i'm going to go over some scenarios do you realize how oh everything you've done you've probably violated the code it hasn't hurt anybody so it hasn't been a big deal but you're you're always doing you know almost everything in this in this code every day you practice well, like nothing right. is black and white which i hate that's oh, why i hate ethics i want just i want an answer i want someone to tell me the answer that is ethical that is not ethical and then we're done rob is very black and white I, it drives me nuts yeah. Well, and, and as behavior analysts, that's, that's our bread and butter, right? So we want to think about how can we operationally define the things that we're doing so that there's consistency. And then once you start really getting into depth with ethical practice, that capability of operationally define what might be considered ethical or unethical starts to slowly and in many cases uncomfortably chip away. So that's why it's important to have some type of understanding of what it is to look for. I, I think you hit on a really interesting and important point is that as behavior analysts, we face potentially ethical challenges on a daily basis. Something likely, whether we're aware of it or not, something is likely coming up. Ideally, we're able to have a little bit of foreshadowing so that we can better prepare, but it's likely impossible to prepare for any inevitability when it comes to a challenging ethical situation. So having different scenarios, whether it be those that are really complex to those that are fairly simple, almost works like like you're working out at the gym. It's, it's like a muscle to build up so that when you find yourself in one of these inevitable situations, hopefully you're a little bit better able to approach it and manage it, whether that be looking at the scenario for what it is or bringing in support and supervision, um, asking colleagues for, for their uh, advice and assistance. But if you're not thinking about these potential ethical challenges and you're kind of hoping everything's going to go under the rug, then you're potentially opening the door for more problematic situation. Mm-hmm. So before we talk about these um, ethical scenarios, I was wondering what your thoughts were on the new language surrounding the code, talking about these as less of guidelines and more as now codes that we have to follow. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and, and there's been a lot, especially uh, there's been a lot of talk about the, the change in the code and, and the new update, and especially some of the updates to the actual code language specifically within the item. But I, I understand where it's coming from, thinking about our field and, and the practice and, and comparing ourselves to our related fields like psychology or counseling and things like that. Most of those other groups, most of those other professions have something similar to our ethics code where it is much more considered a rule-based system versus just a guideline that's a suggestion to follow. Mm -hmm. And if you think about, I mean, why we even have a code in the first place, the first part and probably the first reason of why we have a code is to guide and promote ethical behavior of, of those of us who call ourselves behavior analysts. In a very large part, it's in response to those who came before us who at least associated themselves with behaviorism or behavioral practices, um, most of which were not behavior analysts themselves, but are still related to us in some way, or at least in the public's eye, are related to us. And then the other reason why why we likely have a code is just to increase that public trust in us, in ourselves as a field, so that when we go out to work with the individuals and, and the companies that we hope to work with, that there's an understanding that we're doing so with, with a high standard and that we're holding ourselves to the high standard. I find myself saying that we're, we're, we're like the Hebrew national hot dogs of, of the human <laughs> services field because we hold ourselves to this higher standard. So, and so that's true. kind of what, yeah, and it's, it's, it's kind of what the code allows us to do. It's a more than just a guideline, more than just something that's suggested to follow, but it's more of a, a systematic approach to ethical practice being closer to good clinical practice. Hmm. That was a really good answer. Thanks. <laughs> Are those oh. ones that they snap when you cook them? Yeah. No, that's a different one. They're all different. <laughs> it's a ballpark. <laughs> yeah. So that's totally not, different. That's not the one totally that you like different. knock on the door and say, I used to live here in those commercials. <laughs> oh, is that like Oscar Mayer? I don't like know. Oscar Mayer ones? I don't know. <laughs> so many hot dogs. 
So, Darren, as a, <laughs> as a licensed psychologist and a BCBA, mm-hmm. have you ever found yourself in an, a complex ethical situation in which you had two codes you were trying to follow that were at odds with each other, or are they written parallel in enough parallel that something like that's never happened? Yeah, great question. You know, I, I could say personally, I really haven't found myself in the position where I really had to ask myself of, of who I needed to answer to as far as, as which code. I guess fortunately for me and for my my profession or professions, the codes are fairly similar. Um, a lot of what the BACB code was written from has been an adoption of the APA code, the American Psychological Association code. And and there there's not a one-to-one correspondence between the two. Some of the language is a little bit different and some of the expectations are a little bit different, but I think they were both written in a way that worked together fairly nicely. So I've been fortunate that I haven't had to be in the circumstance or the situation where I've said, well, if I'm following one credential or if I'm following one area of expertise, then I'm counterproductive to the other. One thing that I do have to at least be conscious of is in what role I'm working in having having both credentials or, or having both areas of expertise. So if my position and or if my involvement with a, a learner or a client or an organization is that of a clinical psychologist, then I want to make sure that I'm established for my, myself. Yes, I do have the BCBAD cr- credential, but I'm working within the capacity of a psychologist and I will likely not be integrating in the behavior analytic framework. Or if I do, I want to at least make sure I'm clarifying how that's going to happen. One, to just manage the expectations more accurately of of those that I'm working with, but also to make sure that I'm not misrepresenting either field and giving an inaccurate impression of what it means to practice behavior analysis or what it means to be a clinical psychologist. Well, that just sounds like one more complicated step. So Mm -hmm. good good for you for always remembering (laughs) that and and being willing to take that step. (laughs) One job's hard enough for me. I don't know if I could do two, you know? (laughs) In terms of developing these scenarios, you mentioned you took some of these like kind of, uh, you know, pieces from either cases that are or things you run into or your students were bringing up with you. Did you find it hard to get this many good scenarios? Because I was shocked how many of these were great. Because anytime I've tried to come up with an ethical scenario, it's always been uh, someone wants to give you a present. And what do you do? And it's like, well, you got that one. So we're done with that. Well, how long did it take to amass all of these scenarios? It, it, it took a while. I, I think just because the editing process and going back through and, and Adele and I kind of reading it over together and making sure that the language was the way that we wanted. And then also just working with a publisher, you send back different, back and forth, different versions. It, it took a bit to just get from first starting to write something to actually seeing something in print, which is pretty odd to see just as a right, personal awesome. thing, to see some, my name on something. <laughs> But I will say, I really wish it was, I almost wish it was harder to think of the scenarios Mm -hmm. because so many of the things that that I added and that we added to the book were just things that happened and Mm -hmm. or things that happened Mm -hmm. directly to me or or to friends or colleagues of mine where they say, oh my gosh, I, I have an idea. Or, you know, if there was, I wanted to try to cover as much of the code area as possible so we weren't leaving out too many big areas of the code because Mm -hmm. fortunately it did not happen to me uh so then that became thinking about the code and what it meant and and it really didn't take too much unfortunately to think about well i know someone where that that uh this particular situation happened to or happened to similarly and and it applies so that we can highlight this this area or this aspect of the code in the scenario and and so many times you know going through it or, or having someone read it over they would say oh well how'd you you know, how'd you think of that one? Or, oh, this is just completely out, you know, this is way out there. No one's going to believe this. And I was like, no, no, this is, this is one of mine. This, this happened to me. <laughs> I, this, this happened to me the other day. So, um, so there, these are, you know, the, the whole point really of, of the workbook was to highlight common scenarios, not necessarily these are the horrible things that can happen to you in the practice of behavior analysis, but common situations and scenarios that you'll likely face if you're working within this field and then to hopefully better approach them from a clinically sound perspective and an ethically sound perspective. Mm. One more question, then we'll be into the to the ethics mailbag, as we'll call it. Did you have any pushback when have like from people reading the ethical scenarios? Like, have you had anyone like email you and be like, this is what I would do. This, why did you put this in here? I don't think it's unethical. 
No, not yet. Good. Although I would okay. really, I, I would almost hope that that would happen because I think the, one of the goals, I guess, of, of writing the workbook and, and putting it out there was not to say this is what it means to be an ethical practitioner, mm. because I think that's, that's where we get into a lot of murky and muddy waters. First of all, I, I'm, I'm not a member. I'm, I'm a BCDA, but I'm not a member or employed by the the BACB, so I really can't speak on behalf of what's considered right or wrong or, or what have you. Related Good answer. To the code. <laughs> I wasn't tempting um, you there, but yes. after you my, started my, my that disclaimer. Out there. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> but fortunately, I think m- most people, if they do have an impression to say, I, I don't really see this as being a challenging situation, well, that opens us up to the discussion to say, well, why don't you see that to be a challenging situation? Because it, from their perspective or, or their scenario or their interpretation of it, it, it might not be. Um, I still think it might be something to be conscious of or cognizant of as you practice. But that's, that's I think, where the, the questions that come with the workbook hopefully generate some, some discussion. You know, I think, think as, as a practice, just behavior analysis in general, we're, we're getting a lot better at thinking about how ethics should apply to the practice of behavior analysis. But we still have a way long way to go in thinking about how we can apply behavior analysis to ethical practice. So looking at ethical situations or looking at maybe challenging circumstances and thinking about it from a behavior analytic perspective, what are the contingencies in place that are maintaining ethical behavior or unethical behavior? What are the circumstances that might be contributing to ethical behavior or unethical behavior? Because this is just, it, again, it's just, it's just behavior. This is what we're good at as a field is looking at behavior and understanding the, the context under which those behaviors occur. And there's so much that we can be doing thinking about ethical or unethical practice from a behavior analytic perspective. That's very true. Oh, that was good. I know. I know. It is, it is one of those great truths when you realize, wait a minute, everything's behavior. My whole life, everything around me, it's <laughs> right. all behavior. You know, you can, you can remove yourself just that tiny bit and not be like, that guy's a jerk. Probably because he's a jerk all the time. As, no, you know, there are probably things, you know, there's variables leading to jerk-ish behavior. Yeah, <laughs> that, that clinically defined jerk behavior. Yeah. Okay, well, let's get into some scenarios. So the, the whole book has about 80, 86 really cool scenarios. They all sort of have similar questions, and then you have some specific questions. So the questions are always going to be, you read a scenario, you list all applicable ethics codes. That's a straightforward one. Provide the rationale for the chosen codes, and if you believe a violation has occurred, identify factors that may have led to the current scenario and strategies that could have prevented the scenario from occurring, and given the scenario, describe the ethical course of action moving forward, including potential risk factors and areas that may require continued monitoring. So that's always the question for every scenario, and then again, you have you know specific ones. I like that you added in those specific scenario questions based on whichever scenario it was. I was a little disappointed. There was no ethics uh, answer key in the back that I could just sort of flip to <laughs> and just get the answers from. I was also disappointed, although I'm, <laughs> I like that you didn't have it because then students can't cheat because that's yep. what I've frequently done in the past <laughs> when I'm reading scenarios and then found in the back of the book, I'm like reading it. I'm like, who, what did they say? And then I flip to the back. Mm-hmm. So I like that they're not there. Mm-hmm. What do we do if they're not there and we don't know? That's, that's awesome. So, th- we, you know, there was a lot of debate about that because when we were writing the book, I had what I at least thought would be the answer key. And then we, we went back and forth so many times thinking about should we include an answer key in the back of the book? Should we put what we think the, the applicable ethics codes are to each scenario? Or should we maybe even come out with just a teacher copy so that way the professors who are using the book can, can have that at least on hand so they can check the answers or compare them to the students? And at least for, for right now, the thought was, let's not put the, the quote unquote, the answers in because we wanted to leave it open for interpretation by the student or even by the professor. Um, we didn't want to be seen as we are the people on high who are stating this is the scenarios or this is the codes that you need to be or should be thinking about for each scenario. We wanted to leave that, that inquisitive nature up to the person utilizing the workbook because that second part of here's the codes where I think are apply and then the why of it, that really gets into the, the, the crux of the book. Here's why I think these codes apply. And if we give those answers, then we're kind of taking away that 
that learning opportunity for for the person using the book. Oh, I know. Well, so great, le- but so horrible. <laughs> we'll, we'll do. We'll do the next best thing is is we make the author talk to us on the phone and tell us if our answers are correct. So okay, well, you That's... Could, could always always give me a call and say here's what I was thinking. All right, like, Darren. <laughs> I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> All right, so maybe maybe I shouldn't open that up. <laughs> okay, no, no, no. We'll, we'll put your number. You said it. We'll put your number on. Everyone can call. Yeah. All the <laughs> five five five. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> ethics, <laughs> ethics help. All right, so we're gonna start with our case scenario. So Diana, do you want you want to share how you wanted to format this episode? Sure. So I thought it would be fun too if we thought of this as what I was terming ethics mailbag. So. Not that we're requiring you, Darren, to answer all of these questions, but I thought it would just be a fun format if we did it kind of like a Dear Abby column. So we will introduce the scenarios with a Dear Dr. Darren intro (laughs) as we introduce the the problem. But then we'll all work together to solve it. Right. And then I'll imagine that your tiny picture is next to Dear Dr. Darren in huge letters. Smiling picture. Smiling. It's a glamour shot. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, perfect with a hazy glamour shot and elbow yep, pad. Exactly. <laughs> He'll probably have Some a rose. Vaseline on the lens. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Some a rose, you know, a little rose next to your face. Yep. And then we will we will do our best to answer each of these and then you will tell us how right or wrong we are. <laughs> all right. And if we were wrong, we're gonna edit that out and just assume we were right the first time. So it's all gonna perfect. sound great. All right. All right. So I'll I'll start us off. Okay. Or do you want to start no, us no, off, Tony? Okay. You do it. What are we doing? So okay. Case this is case number one from the book. It's called Request for Service. Now, I did do the liberty. If, you, if you're looking, you're doing a second edition and you want some suggestions, I did come up with some alternate titles for some of these too, Darren. So if you know if you want to use them, feel free. Um, I thought maybe Perfect. we could call this one, I'm a big fan of your work. You know, it's kind of the, <laughs> the title. You know, just, just throwing it out there. All right. Yeah, we, we tried to be fun with the titles in there, but it, sometimes it got away from us and thinking, got to get a little too creative in the titles. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just, like, that one's a request for sure. Like, that's pretty sure. I did flip a couple pages ahead. Splitting up is hard to do is one of the titles. So <laughs> it, it, it was definitely not that dry. But just in case, I always like to, you know, to give some options in case you want to edit. All right. So, dear Dr. Darren, my name is Janie. I'm a board certified <laughs> behavior analyst who owns and operates a small ABA based agency with four other BCBAs on staff, along with additional administrative personnel in a rural area. Marie, a woman who works in the agency's scheduling department, mentioned that her two-and-a-half-year-old son received a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, and she's looking for available resources. Because Marie works in scheduling, she's very familiar with the clinical knowledge of the agency's BCBAs and is impressed by their level of training and the dedication of the staff. She has reviewed the agency's staffing and supervisory commitments and knows that they have the availability to take on additional cases... She is also a member of one of the agency's accepted insurance carriers. Marie asked if her son can participate in an intake assessment and receive services. Case one was in the chapter on the first, you know, the first uh, code, you know, the first code. So we started there. But of course, I, I think the nice thing about all these scenarios is it wasn't just these only relate to the first code. There were always other codes that you could sort of add mm-hmm. in. Uh, that made sense. So, did one of you guys want to start off with what applicable codes do we like think I are do. relevant here? Yeah, but the first thing I want to remind people too that I've I've come across in my my teaching of ethical ethicalness, I guess, is that the code gets updated and nobody knows about it. Have you know this, Darren? Have you mm-hmm. noticed this? So the code got updated in March. So make sure that, I'm not sure what they change, but make sure when you are looking at the code that you're looking at the most recent code version. I don't think it's it's wild changes, but I think that's important. So the last updated version was in March. One time I was looking at it and we were all looking at the wrong, wrong versions of codes, which is <laughs> oh. awesome. So I'm thinking the first thing that may be awry here is... Professional integrity, potentially, 1.04. Mm-hmm. What, what do you think, Darren? Yeah, I, I think what you'll probably find with, with professional integrity is that that's probably, at least in some way, applicable across all almost every yeah. scenario. <laughs> there was there was a talk, I think it was it was either at, at Calaba a, a couple of years ago or 
or or ABAI recently, where they gave since the new newest version, since we essentially became the code, the BACB has been able to collect data related to the most reports of potential ethical violations. And I think integrity and I believe supervision, at, at least at the last talk that I went to, those numbers might be updated since then, but integrity related ethical questions or potential violations was the number one thing, if I'm remembering correctly, that got brought up. And and it really makes a lot of sense. I mean, so much of, of what we do has to do with our own integrity as practitioners. And then especially once you start getting into questionable behaviors um, and, and potentially unethical behaviors, so that integrity code uh, plays plays a pretty big part. Hmm. Yeah, you can't really have ethics without integrity. <laughs> yeah. And vice versa. It's true. <laughs> so more specifically, I think, I think there may be a violation or a, a discussion of a violation with 1.04C. So behavior analysts follow through on obligations and contractual and professional commitments with high quality work and refrain from making professional commitments they cannot keep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then D too, right? Yeah, absolutely. Behavior conforms to the legal and ethical codes of the so- social and professional community of which they are members. I like that one. And then I love it when they're like, see also. <laughs> 10.02A. And then I think the big one for me was 1.06. Which we're probably going to reference maybe a couple times. Yeah. Multiple relationships. Right. Yeah. And this one, I think overall, mul- the multiple relationships code is tricky, right? Because, you know, when you're, I know that some of my students, when they read scenarios, they're like, you kind of know the person. That's a relationship. It's a multiple relationship. Mm-hmm, I, think, mm-hmm. I think it's 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 more nuanced than that, mm-hmm. right? So mm-hmm. uh, this scenario specifically, we also would probably add in the 107 because there's a supervisory uh, right component mm-hmm. to the relationship because Janie is yeah Janie is is the boss of the of mm-hmm. the company. So there's going to be a relate you know there's going to be that supervisory relationship if they are, were to enter into the dual role of I'm now hiring the person who's providing services and i'm hiring you as the person who works in my company that's going to be kind of the hard the big one it's a hard one especially because she probably you know janie probably thinks that her staff are the best right Mm -hmm. right i think they are (laughs) yeah they must be clearly um of course (laughs) and as a parent you want what's best for your child Mm -hmm. right so i think that's that's a struggle. Mm-hmm. That's just a like a personal struggle that's like hard, you know, hard to separate. Yeah. Like what does Janie do? I think that's a, that's an interesting thing to to think about kind of related to this. I mean, as I mentioned kind of one of my things that I do is I provide therapy for parents of children with autism, not working as a BCBA, but uh, as, a, as a clinical psychologist and and trying to understand kind of and have empathy and and validating the perspective of many families is it's understandable that as a parent of a child who's potentially going to be receiving services, you want them to get the best. So um, the parents don't have the obligation to the ethics code that, that we might have, and, and they might not necessarily have that experience in studying and learning about the ethics code to see how, yes, these are the best, the best providers in the land, but this could potentially open the door to some challenging circumstances that will eventually impact my, my kid uh, down the road, so so it becomes a little bit of a hard situation to navigate, being conscious of where the family's coming from, but also understanding uh, what might lead to best practices. Right, mm-hmm. and bringing maybe the the family into understanding as well. So, like, we may be mm-hmm. doing great now, but if you know something hits the fan, or you know, like there's trouble ahead, it's gonna be a lot harder to navigate those waters. You know, mm-hmm. with these multiple lines of relationships going on. Yeah. Right. And and that's not to say to practice as if everything that you potentially do is going to lead to a problem down the road because oh, no. that's gonna make you that's gonna make you ineffective as a practitioner too. You're gonna just be stagnant. You're gonna stop yourself from making any decision. But being aware of common things or common situations that happen when those before us have gone down those roads is, is part of being a good practitioner. Mm. The last code that I thought might be relevant would be sort of related to two oh three, the the you know, arranging for appropriate consultation. Because I think we're all in agreement that there's definitely a potential for a multiple relationship here. But it's not as simple as to say, so don't get in one. The end. Because you still right. have a parent with a child like in need of appropriate services. And as a BCBA, you, you, you're also ethically bound to make sure that you're advocating for this family to receive ABA services. So you can't, you can't dodge that one. 
Yeah, and, and that's not to skip ahead in the questioning or anything, but that's one of the reasons why in every single scenario there's that question of what to do next with whatever you choose to do. Because part of, I think this goes into the uh, having a functional perspective on ethics, you always need to be thinking about what, what's, what's the potential repercussions, what's the, for, for lack of a term, what's the better, what's potential consequence to my choice or this behavior. So if I were to potentially take on this child with, as a client, what might that mean? Or if I don't, what should I do in order to make sure that this individual has the, if not with us, but maybe with somebody else, the best care possible? What's, what's the appropriate next step? One of the things about this scenario, and, and I know it's scenario number one, so it seems kind of funny to have this here, but a violation really hasn't even occurred yet, mm -hmm. right? We, we, this is kind of one of those, a potential situation, a situation that could potentially happen depending on our course of action or, or the circumstances or situation. But right now, you just have an individual who's saying, can you accept my child as a client? But, but the next steps, the next things that happen could, could be uh, either a helpful path or, a, unfortunately, a very unhelpful path for this, for this family. Yeah. Right. It's sort of like the movie version. You know, you've got, you've got uh, Marie coming in. She's like, I got the schedule sheets and I've got my, you know, kids' paperwork. And uh, by the way, you got to provide services for me because I know you can. And she sort of have Janie turn to the camera and go, what do I do? And it sort of pauses. <laughs> One of those like Zach Morris Saved by the Bell time out. You know, here's what we're doing. <laughs> And she's got to yeah. figure it out because, yeah, nothing, nothing's happened yet. But, you know, yeah. you've got maybe, you know, a couple, you've got a little while. You can only hold Marie off for so long with an answer before you're violating the ethical code or not violating the ethical code or getting in a bad situation that isn't a violation. It's just not not the you know ideal outcome. Right. Volume two of the book will be a, a choose your own adventure yeah. uh, version. <laughs> totally. Goblins it, killed you. Oh, no. <laughs> Actually, that would be amazing. That would be kind of awesome. Like, right? So what does Janie do? If you think that she accepts the client, please turn to page 26. Mm -hmm. If she right. doesn't, please, uh, please you know, turn to page 49. <laughs> choose your own ethical adventure. Oh, good. That's, that's not a bad idea. It's I, not. I feel like you, you can totally sell some copies of that. Darren, right. I'll hit you up after this. <laughs> All right. Do we yeah, we'll, we'll talk. <laughs> I, yeah, right. I think, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know. Were there any other codes? That... Well, we, we kind of covered 1.07a, which was exploitative relationships due to the supervisory mm -hmm. yep. role. Yep, yep. And then we will come around to talking about 2.03a, I think, which is uh, arranging for appropriate consultation. I did. I said those. Fine. Did you say the numbers? <laughs> she, she, he I, did. I thought I did, yeah. He 100% did. What was I doing? I don't know. <laughs> one one thing I think we do miss, too, is 2.02 responsibility. I think that mm -hmm. one also okay. hits along with integrity. It kind of hits all of them, too, because this is the behavior analyst responsibility to all parties affected by behavior analytic services, mm -hmm. even though right now they're not in a relationship, right? But it will. But, it, but it could, could be, be applicable. Right? Yeah. So you want to make sure that it could be that they've defined exactly what it is they're going to do, what it is they're not going to do, mm -hmm. that they have a contract, that they've identified, you know, all of the certain scenarios that they'll need to identify. Um, I think that one's important. I, I mean, I, I definitely appreciate all the codes that you, you brought up. And this is actually, I love hearing this because even if there's code that I didn't initially think of, when, when writing the scenario or when going back after I wrote the scenario to then think of, okay, what codes might apply here? I think that there's validity to the, the code that you all are bringing up. And even if it's not necessarily the clear violation, the codes that often get brought up in relation, that's going to help you as a practitioner to then think about, well, what would be the next most appropriate thing to do moving forward? Because I at least want to keep this in mind. Mm -hmm. I might not think of this as something that's reportable or a, uh, a harmful circumstance or situation, but if I'm if I feel as though this code might relate, then that's going to then uh, prompt me then to think of okay, how am I best going to assist this individual, and in this case, this individual uh, and this individual's parent who's looking for support and looking for services. Mm -hmm. And I also think there's a value too in recognizing that there might always be more codes that you think are applicable that may not be as applicable or would only like mm -hmm. you're saying, you know, Darren, only be applicable if you take certain actions. Because I think, mm -hmm. you know, when you first start doing ethics, at least my path was, I'm never going to do any of these things. So I never have to worry about ethics. But then you realize that's right. not you can't do that. I love so that. then you say, oh, well, then I will assume that all of these codes are always relevant. And then I'll always be vigilant and never make an ethical violation. But then you realize, no, that also is not a workable <laughs> position mm -hmm. to be in, because you're not always making these violations. And you're, you're going to 
you know, try to dodge things that, that don't exist. And it's a lot of that paring down of when are these codes relevant? When could they be relevant later? And understanding that there's kind of an ebb and flow too of the, the various codes, you know, that they will be more relevant. If you take this step, you know, you choose this adventure. These are the ones that are now more relevant than the others. And it's kind of a thought process and it doesn't get to end. Huh. But for Janie, we should probably give her some next steps. So what do we think? Next steps for Janie. Tell Marie, I can have to fire you if I, you want services. Probably not the best next step. <laughs> tell her, nope, can't provide services. You have the wrong schedule. Probably not the next step. Yeah, and I think a, an important component here is that they live in a rural area, mm-hmm. which is not the easiest word to say. Rural girl. The rural girl. <laughs> they were, if they were in Massachusetts, you'd be like, find another BCBA. There's tons of them around. Yeah. There's yeah. one probably. One probably is your neighbor. <laughs> right. There's one behind you. <laughs> and there still could be some concern there, even if right. there were no, other true. options, if Marie really felt like these were the best and if Janie felt like her company was the best, you know, et cetera. But chances are they don't even have those other options based on the scenario if they are in a rural area. So it could be that Janie's company is kind of one of the only options that might be available Mm -hmm. for services. One of the thoughts I had is, would it be possible to try to do like distance contracting with another BCBA or to, or maybe have that person serve as like the the overall overseer so that Mm -hmm. you could try to remove someone from the kind of direct chain of supervision so you can mm-hmm. try to do that and, and again it's a it's a scenario so we can say there there could be those resources they could exist mm-hmm. there could be you know a university that can do distance supervision they can't do the direct services but they could take on the supervision and then at least that gets you out of some of the uh codes related to the supervision piece minimizes the risk for the dual relationships that would be going on uh, though that may not exist. So if that weren't to exist, I guess what would be the next thing? That would be easy. If you if you have the resources, great. Problem partially resolved. Mm-hmm. But then if you don't, I guess that, that would be the question of is it enough to just say, well, let's all acknowledge that these codes are kind of always going to be in danger of being violated and just do our best to not violate them or not take advantage? Or can you even do that in this situation? Because you know that that level of supervision is going to continue to exist. Right. And I, and I was, you know, while you were talking, I was thinking, well, there's probably no wrong answer here. But then I kind of thought and corrected myself because, yeah, there's definitely wrong. I mean, firing, <laughs> firing her and, and saying, you know, good luck with that, but we'll still take on your kids yeah, as a yeah. client probably is not, <laughs> is not the quote unquote right answer. Here. I like that, would that be one. Slightly <laughs> wrong. But, but I think one of the reasons why I, why I tossed in that in a rural area was to then give that extra ellipses at the end of the sentence, make you have to think a little bit more about the circumstance as far as, well, if we're in a rural area where, um, and that is a hard word to say, uh, (laughs) if we're in a rural area where there really is no one else available, well, then my course of action moving forward might be different. But, But again, I think this is where thinking about the circumstance in context becomes important because Yes, in that case, maybe you might be more open to taking on this individual as a client, but that's not the end of it. That's not the end of it. You can't just say, well, rural area, no one else is here. Let me just take them on. There's so many other things that that decision then opens up as far as uh, making sure that that while there is a multiple relationship, that you're reducing the opportunities for harm as much as possible. Or if you say, well, there are plenty of other practitioners, let me let me give you a list and let me assist you with the referral process and give my suggestions and things like that. Well, that might not be the end of your, your involvement either because mm-hmm. now they might be receiving services from someone else, but working at your agency, yeah. they might come to you for questions or suggestions. So being mindful of that is, is important. You know, one of the things I find myself, I, get, I, I do some talks on, uh, and I talk a lot about, about with my students, is adding color to the ethics code. There's a way of thinking, especially since we move from guidelines to code, there's a way of thinking about the ethics code in black and white. So it's either right or wrong, uh, ethical or unethical. If the code says to do it, you do it. If the code says not, you don't. And that's as simple as it is because anything else is just bad. And But I think that that's right. not, as this discussion has gone, I think most people would agree that that's probably not a, a helpful or accurate way of thinking about the ethics code. And, and I would guess that that's also not what the intention was in developing and having the code out there. But then the other side would be the gray area. 
the gray areas of the code. And that's what I hear about so much. And I actually used to love talking about these different gray areas of the code, um, that these were the areas where we weren't really sure what to do. We weren't sure how to follow the code. Multiple codes kind of seem to be counter to each other. So, so what should we do? And, and I, I used to love talking about that because it's for, great for discussion. But then I started hating actually thinking about the code as, as having <laughs> potential gray areas because gray kind of means like, well, we don't know what to do, so I'm just going to do this thing and, and hope for the best. So it's kind of, it, it leads to ambiguity, it leads to confusion and kind of almost like a learned helplessness type of situation. Mm. But then I started thinking, well, well, what do we do, again, as behavior analysts? We understand behavior. We, we learn about the context in which behaviors occur, what's going on prior to and following the maintaining, the maintaining factors of each behavior. We add color where color does not exist. So if we, we can look at these scenarios, we can look at these circumstances from a contextual perspective and understand the ethics code, not in terms of black and white, wrong or right, or gray and confusing, but we can add color to the ethics code by understanding it and how it's going to impact us, how it's going to impact the field, and how it's going to impact the individuals that are that are seeking our support. It's very true. And I think I think I think that is the better way to, to look at it. I, I do like that perspective, Darren, the idea of the not just gray, it's it's just more behavior and then looking at those variables i think that does allow us to continue acting rather than you're right just saying like shrug i don't know this is a tough right. one i guess whatever answer is a good answer because life's hard and that's that not, <laughs> not <laughs> throw all the papers in the air although we all know why that's the behavior we want to engage in because oh man that's the easy one where there's no response effort involved you sort of just keep doing stuff and then shrug mm -hmm. no no accountability all right. right. So, well, they were in a rural area and there's no one else. Well, I guess I don't know what else to do. I guess I'll just take them. And then if you just leave it at that, well, you might op have opened the doors for some pretty problem behaviors if you just, or problem situations if you just leave it at that. Yeah, I guess in that scenario, I mean, is there more we want to say about that? Or it's sort of, we talked about, ideally, you could get more resources. Otherwise, you would just have to be really monitoring for what other harms, because now you're talking about more codes than I think we discussed in well, terms of... Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mm -hmm. think you would, if you were in a situation where you needed to take on... Marie's child and I mean we haven't like fully outright stated but of course our foremost concern should be that this child gets appropriate services yep. right? right so right. we would want to ensure that that's happening one way or the other and if it ended up that there was no other option then we would have to try to create a situation where it, it seemed as though we could ethically and safely provide these services for this child so if you ended up in that scenario I think You'd want to talk to Marie about the fact that there are now going to be multiple relationships happening and try to establish from the from the beginning the guidelines for what those relationships are going to look mm -hmm. like and what's going to – everyone basically needs their behavior defined according to employee behavior and what's going to fall into that category and then this new relationship that you now have, a therapeutic relationship and what behavior is going to fall into that category and how everyone's going to operate wearing those different hats. And then I think as much as Janie can separate herself from the care that's going to be provided to that child, maybe they could hire a new RBT or a, have a BCB cover the case who does has very little interaction with Marie. Ideally, mm -hmm. that would they're be always out in the field and never come to the office. Um, yeah. If those are, are options, mm -hmm. right? Oh. oh, boy, that was case scenario one, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Told we you. did it guys <laughs> Whew, okay we're one scenario down but we've got four more coming up right after the break stay tuned do you want to be a bcba sure we all do now you can come to Regis College in Weston, Mass. to get your graduate degree. Choose from any one of these courses. Masters of Science in Applied Behavior Analysis. Masters of Science in Special Education. Dual degree in Special Ed and ABA. Or be eligible for your post-master certificate. You can complete your degree and be ready to sit for the exam in two years. And our 2017 grads had a 100% pass rate on the BACB exam. Come enjoy practicum placement support, ethics mini handbooks, PhD level professors, small class sizes, and a service trip to Iceland. If interested, don't delay. Supplies are limited. Learn more at regiscollege.edu. Again, that's www.regiscollege.edu. 
regiscollege.edu. One more time, www.regiscollege.edu. See you there! And we are back talking with Dr. Darren Sush all about ethical case scenarios in applied behavior analysis. Uh, but right before we get back to our last, we have four more scenarios we're going to be discussing. But before then, I wanted to make sure that everyone listening knew the fun news that ABA Inside Track is ACE approved. By listening to the show, you are able to earn continuing education credits. Hooray! All you need to do is listen to the whole episode. Go to our website, abainsidetrack.com slash get hyphen CEUs and put in two secret code words that we've hidden throughout the episode. The first of those code words is Walden, W-A-L-D-E-N, like the pond that was the prequel to B.F. Skinner's Walden 2. You have to read both of them if you want to know the whole story. <laughs> the prequel, I like that. <laughs> It was written way before, you know, but it's got a lot of the backstory of the characters you will meet in Walden, too. It's very important. Walden. Let's move on to our next case scenario. Diana, do you want to read read this one? Sure. It's called Case 37, Rights to Results, or, again, alternate title, Burn After Reading, would be the, the one I thought of. <laughs> which, which wouldn't be ethical on its own, so you don't, don't burn your assessments, folks. All right, here we go. Dear Dr. Darren... Uh, someone I know <laughs> named Reva. Hypothetically. Is, yeah, hypothetically, is a board certified behavior analyst and has been contracted by the local school district to conduct an FBA and an adaptive skills assessment on a high school student currently receiving ABA services through the school. Reva met with the student and interviewed the parents, school personnel, and treatment providers, as well as conducted several comprehensive direct and indirect assessments. Following her evaluation, Reba completed her report and reviewed her assessments with the student's parents. The parents were very concerned and felt that the school may decrease services after receiving Reba's results. They asked that she not share the report with the school. Reba informed the parents that she was contracted by the school to complete the assessment and would have to provide her results. The parents were not aware that because the school funded Reba's assessment, they were entitled to the report. What should Reba do? Sincerely, a concerned friend. <laughs> Sincerely, <laughs> hypothetically, not Reba. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so this one spoke to me because I've, I've worked in public schools for a, a large chunk of my career. And one of the services, especially with the changes in autism insurance funding laws, we have had many more third party providers, sometimes paid for by the parents, sometimes paid for by the district itself. And so you do run into these scenarios where you have so many people involved in a case, which is good in a lot of ways, but does lead to, okay, so who is responsible to do what? Who is the BCBA responsible to in this scenario? And do the rights of the family or the rights of the client change? The client could be being, you know, any one of 50 different people in some cases. Mm -hmm. Do those rights change based on who's funding this? Who's paying for this? Who asked for these services? In looking at some codes that were relevant, certainly th this was in, uh, I think this was the chapter on, chapter two. So it was on responsibility to clients, which again, you have a lot of clients in this case. I just kind of started with, you know, 202, just general, your responsibility to all parties affected by behavior analytic services. So in this case, you have your school system, you have your the child or the uh, young young person you're working with, and you have their parents, even though they're not the ones who were paying for this report, they're still you still have a responsibility to them to provide those services. I thought 204, pretty much all, you know, almost all of 204 in terms of looking at third party involvement in services, in terms of were the roles delineated, you have you should be delineating the roles of the people involved. So the BCBA, who are you responsible to? What is the role? What are you going to accomplish? And then, you know, looking at, you know, B if there's a risk of behavior analysts being called upon to perform conflicting roles, making sure mm -hmm. that they clarify the nature and direction of their responsibilities, which I, I think someone I, I saw some talk where someone referred to as like, where's the money coming from kind of becomes some of that, like whoever's paying, you probably want to make sure that you talk to them, maybe not first, but make sure it's clear, like, this is what you are paying for. This is what the service is going to look like. And then how will this relate to my responsibility to the other people who could be receiving services? Um, in this case, it was just the assessment. So mm -hmm. that does change a little bit some of those responsibilities. 
Jackie, any other ones that, that jumped out as, at you? There's always my favorite 10.06, being familiar with this code. <laughs> <laughs> that one's my most favorite. You can just tack that one onto every ethical scenario. You scenario. can. <laughs> Similar to 1.04, integrity. Let's just assume there's always mm-hmm. integrity, and we always need to know our ethics code. <laughs> Uh, I as, do as, love as a lame joke of... that no one that no one ever laughs at when people say why'd you write the book i say because 10.06 <laughs> and then they just stare at me no, <laughs> but, you, know, nice. you know what i would laugh and top list. i i would laugh at that joke for you i would laugh so hard <laughs> 10.06 is like when the teachers like read all the instructions and then the first instruction is just write your name on the paper and turn it in it's yeah. like it's like that kind of like yeah loophole i don't know what do you think darren do you think there's any more than what rob said well i i I think you all really hit the nail on the head, especially with, with 2.04. But it's so evident within the scenario that we do have that third party who's, who's funding the service. But then also 3.03, that behavior analytic assessment consent, where, where it does say that it's our responsibility to inform the individuals who were participating in the assessment what the results of the assessment might be used for and, and who that's going to be going to. Right. And that's something that unfortunately didn't happen in this case. Mm-hmm. So we have parents who are really concerned, and, and I think within the scenarios is they're concerned that certain funding or certain services might not be available because of the results that, they, that came out here. And had they been aware of who would be able to see these results, then they might have had the capability of essentially saying, no, this is not something that we want to participate in, Mm -hmm. or at least went into the assessment process knowing that regardless of the results, there might be a response, there might be a responsibility of the behavior analyst to share that information. I think one of the things that you all pointed out with, uh, especially with that responsibility code, that's maybe not necessarily a a violation here, I I, I don't know, but certainly kind of an umbrella uh, code to think about is because as, as behavior analysts, our responsibility is to the client. And then, but then how do we identify the client who holds most of our responsibility? And we kind of go down the funnel. And usually it's the individual who's the most vulnerable or the individual who's not able to advocate for themselves. So we have the child here who is the subject of the assessment. So even though we have the school who funded the assessment, they essentially own it. But we have a circumstance where maybe potentially, hopefully not, but sharing the results of that that assessment could be harmful to this vulnerable individual. Mm. So then how do we maintain our responsibility? How do we maintain our responsibility to our funding source, but also make sure that we're more than conscious about how that might impact the potential for harm for the client and for the for, for this kid? And then the overarching guideline here that I think we all have to think about, which may not, I don't think it would be a violation of this guideline, but I think it's something that should always be in our fore, you know, our forefront when we're thinking about all these different relationships is 7.01 promoting an ethical culture, right? Mm-hmm. So if this is yep. not something that we've thought that would be problematic, right? And we weren't thinking about being transparent and being honest and being open and, you know, making our contract so that all parties involved know exactly what we're doing, we are in violation of the code, right? Because we aren't promoting that ethical culture and making other people, including the school district and the parents, aware that we have to abide by the code. And and I think that's imp- it's important to think about, right? Because a lot of the times, I think you're not thinking of the, the, the bigger picture and thinking more so of, okay, I'm going to do this assessment, then I'm going to present it, then I'm going to move on with my day, but not thinking of the broader implications of what that could actually mean. Mm. In terms of violation, I, I think, yeah, the, it, potentially it's hard to say exactly what kind of a, how, how intense the violation is, but probably some amount of minor violation in terms of just not not clarifying that role. Uh, I mean, certainly it, it's a small scenario, so it's possible that the person really did clarify the role and they just didn't mention right, it in the scenario, right. in which case there wouldn't be a violation so much as there would just be some confusion. But I, I guess anytime we're talking about con- informed consent, there is always that that tough situation of if, you know, whoever you're getting the consent from later says, wait, no, 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 I know you said that to me, but I didn't understand yeah. that's what it right. meant. You know, on the one right. hand, you can say, well, I said it, so you're just you're you're just being ignorant and that doesn't count. But if they still say, I don't understand, you know, you're, you're always on the on the hook for like, well, did you really get informed consent in terms of yeah. just the letter of yeah. the law for informed consent or the actual ethical meaning of informed consent. So let's assume that there was some somewhat of a, of a violation. 
it's hard to say how major too because the the recommendations might have been very astute it might have actually pointed to uh, I know the parents think it's going to mean less services, but maybe they're actually going to mean better services. You know, right. more right. doesn't always mean bad. It could, you know, or more doesn't always mean good. More could mean just over, you know, oh, it's it's 100 hours of ABA services and they don't get to go to their classroom because they're in these pull out therapies all the time. Maybe the report's talking about targeted services in a <laughs> less restrictive environment. So that might look scary, but actually might be better for for the client in this case. So. Perhaps you'd be able to just explain, kind of apologize to the parent if there was any confusion, try to explain how those recommendations might look, and 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 hopefully they will see this as a, as a net positive for their child. They might not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And it might also be what's best for the client. Mm-hmm. Right? right. Yeah. So, But that's scary, too. Right. If right. you've always so, had and, services and, forever, and now you're like, okay, we're not going to have services anymore, that's scary. Mm-hmm. And so thinking for sure, about for that sure. for the parents and thinking how you can communicate that with them being empathetic and compassionate to, you know, their fear that their child may not continue doing well without the services. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. One, of the, one of the things that, that Bailey and Birch have in, in their book, they have a seven-step model for approaching ethical case scenarios. And most ethics courses, they have, they have that book. So yes, yes, a lot do. of people are probably <laughs> familiar with that model. Yeah. And but one of the things I think really applies here is that contingency plan for ethics. So right. you might have okay, plan A is talk to the family, find out what their concerns are. Is it an accurate concern, or is there something that, or is it just maybe some things that can be discussed, and maybe some some issues that can be kind of brought down by just providing a little bit of uh, additional information to the family, or do they have some legitimate concerns that even when speaking with them, they, these things. Uh, are still present. So then what's your next step? What's the, what's the plan B? What's the plan C? And, and as you continue moving forward. One of the bonus questions that you had in this scenario, Darren, was what if the parents had contracted the BCBA for services? And mm-hmm. I think their confidentiality would be a much more important role. You know, did you get sure. consent to talk to folks at the school? Right, but I think yeah. it makes it much less of an ethical concern because if yeah. the parents decide, oh, I don't like this assessment, mm-hmm. they do not have to share that with the school. If they contracted with you, you'd talk to them about here's the assessment, here's what I'm doing. If they didn't think the results were going to be beneficial, they do not have to give it to the school and the school (laughs) has no rights to demand that they get the assessment because the parent funded it. And if the parents don't like the results, uh, you know, there could certainly be an ethical violation still in terms of you didn't explain what the purpose of the assessment was or what it was going to uh, tell the parents. There could be a concern that you're not explaining that maybe the change in services is beneficial to their child, uh, but Mm -hmm. they probably wouldn't pursue any sort of. Uh, you know, concerns about the BCBA because they'd say, well, I don't like this report and that might be the end of it, you know? So, right. so the only person who might know that you had an ethical violation at all would be you, the BCBA, because you realize, oh, I didn't explain this very well. I should have right. done, you know, but the, the report's probably going to get you know put in a file and never brought out again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that the fact that Reba is contracted to the school system versus being an employee of the school system, like makes this a more interesting scenario too, yeah. because you could end up in this situation where you're coming in, you're not that familiar with sort of the proceedings of that district or exactly how they ask for consent from the parents, what the form perhaps looks like, right? And she may never see any of that. She may just be say, come in and say, oh, yeah, this is all set up for you. All you need to do is the assessment and then the report, right? Yep. I guess, yeah, this would be a very good lesson for Reba that she needs to get more information when she's coming into these scenarios and talk to the parents ahead of time. To make sure everyone knows yeah. what, what actually is about to happen. And at working in a school, I've had to have a discussion about if I'm asked to do a behavior assessment, I'm still <laughs> going to bring the parents in. I still want to talk to the parents about what the assessment is, even though legally, as long as they sign the consent, if the school is the client asking for the assessment that's occurring on school grounds, I could probably skate by. I'm like, well, I didn't talk to the parents. Why do I have to? They signed the thing. I'm not doing a work for them. Right. They're not one of my clients. But you know, even though I don't see them necessarily, they are still one of the clients you're working for. And you want to make sure they understand because if they, I mean, parents, they get things sent home all the time. And I I think they all want to assume that the school's doing the best for their child, which again, schools are almost always trying to do the best Mm -hmm. for their child. 
that doesn't mean sure. that there aren't times that they're going to be at odds about what the best is defined as right. for the child. So I always try to bring them in and it's more paperwork and people will ask, well, they already signed the thing. So couldn't we just move forward? And as much as I want to say, yeah, yeah, yeah that's fine. I don't want to have this paperwork either. Uh, I, I, I don't want to make a phone call. It's cool. You know, nope. I go through the steps because it's important for me to follow my ethics code and model, you know, for the supervisees or, you know, other folks who might be helping with the assessment. I want to make sure they see that we we go through the process. And it's a couple extra steps. And, you know, as much as it always feels like they're going to take forever, they really don't take too long. Like being ethical doesn't usually take that much more time than being unethical, <laughs> especially if you then get like right. giant violation and you got to like be writing letters <laughs> to the BAs and be like, please don't take away my certification. I'm so sorry. So you know. topical right now. Right. And, and, and you know, I've, I know I've said it before, but in most circumstances, good ethical practice is synonymous with good clinical practice. So by taking that little bit of an extra step to connect with the family to uh, make sure that they're understanding what your role is and what you're about to do and who might be privy to those results, that sets the stage for, uh, I would imagine, a much more helpful relationship as you're going through the assessment process, as then you have to talk to them about the results of that assessment. It's just a much more informed position as opposed to if the only contact with you is you know, by name on a paper. Okay, let's move on Ooh. to a different ethical scenario in a different <laughs> setting. We're going to talk about case 52, spread too thin, or as I like to call it, cheaper by the dozen. Yeah, it, was, it was really late when I was doing some of these notes, dude. <laughs> so I got a little punchy. So Jackie, why don't you read this letter? I would love this to. This quote unquote letter. <laughs> Kimiko is a BCBA supervising several board certified assistant behavior analysts or BCABAs and RBTs working toward accruing experience hours to take their BCBA exam. Kimiko and her agency are very passionate about supporting the growth of ABA and follow a strong policy of promoting and hiring from within the agency as much as possible. As a result, many of the direct staff members have inquired about joining ABA-based graduate programs and gaining supervision from Kimiko. While Kamiko wants to super or her staff, she's having trouble dividing her time between providing supervision and maintaining her caseload. Kamiko brought up her concerns with the agency's clinical director, who assured her that as more of the staff become certified themselves, they'll be able to take on more cases and relieve some of Kamiko's clinical responsibilities. Though this may prove to be helpful in the future, Kamiko is currently struggling to appropriately dedicate her time to her required tasks. Okay. Sincerely. Kamiko's friend. <laughs> Jackie. <laughs> so I'm going to assume that everyone wants to be working with Kamiko because she's an awesome supervisor who is a master of the principles uh, as opposed to she has no idea what she's talking about and she makes supervision super easy and will sign whatever form you put in front of her, which would be a totally different ethical uh, quandary. Well, you know <laughs> right. what? Reading this little excerpt sounds like she is passionate and knows what she's doing, right? Because if she's struggling... That means that she's actually trying to do both jobs well. We're assuming, mm -hmm. yes. Right? So we're going to make that assumption. We're making the assumption that she is a good supervisor and she's a good clinician, right? And she's just having some time management problems because she has too many supervisor ease. Well, are they time management problems or is it an issue related to Code 502 talking about supervision volume? Sure. So caring too much. She's caring too. She's too caring. <laughs> So I would not say there's a violation of 502 so much no. as she is acknowledging right. that she is in danger of violating 502, yes. at least yep. in terms of that being able to manage the volume that she's being asked to supervise. That would probably also fit into, say, 504 and uh, 506B, maybe, in terms of designing effective supervision, timely feedback to supervisees, because if you have mm -hmm. too many supervisees, mm -hmm. you probably can't do a great job of sort of designing what their supervisory course should look like sure. and then actually responding to them in a timely fashion. Right. So those would be sort of down the line problems if she continues to have this level of supervision responsibility. You know what could help her, though? If she looks at the code 5.03 supervisory delegation, because maybe <laughs> some of the things that she's trying to do herself with her caseload, she could actually delegate to her supervisees if they have the required skills to do those things. That's true. She could delegate that to them, and then that would relieve her caseload a tiny bit, right? Even though she'd probably have to read it and you know revise it a thousand times, but that's cool. I thought um, about I thought about that one 
Jay, the, the issue that I think the scenario kind of, you know, and I have you reading way too into the scenario <laughs> is just how many new people there are. And right. so many of them seem like they're <laughs> RBTs and they're trying to move up in the organization. So I would assume that it's a lot of folks who are like, I've been working here for four years and I just started my graduate classes. So like, what are you going to delegate? To folks at that point, like small things like small make things. data sheets. That's true. But then there's also I thought about every time I've tried to say, you know what, I'm going to teach all my staff to do something new and then I don't have to do it. And then in a year from now, they'll be so good at it. It's one less job and I can focus on something else. The amount of time it takes to train people to do anything the first time. I never had a time where I haven't said, you know, what would be easier if I just did this by myself and it's short term planning. But in the moment, I'm sure Kamiko could make those data sheets a lot faster sure. than having your staff do it and then look at their data sheet. They give them feedback about their data sheet. That probably would add. So I was worried that would just make the situation worse. Though long term, you're right. That would be, a, yeah. I, I think, a good one to look at. I always find that <laughs> like those types of things that you're describing, Rob, like I'm going to teach someone how to do this so that they can do it themselves. Like I'm much more mentally prepared to do those things when i'm not already completely stressed out right. and stretched so yeah, thin. For sure. right like once you get to that point you're like i don't have time to have some teach someone else how to do this i have to just do it myself or i'm gonna go under with right. the amount of stuff i have to do so she may be in that boat she probably feels that way it sounds like it if she's bringing maybe it i'm reading a little bit in i don't know <laughs> we don't know <laughs> we a lot on poor kamiko here i mean she's just <laughs> I don't know, I'm like sweating a little bit <laughs> but also well, it one thing I want to no, bring up with this, too, is that there is a clinical director. So why isn't the clinical director pulling her own weight in supervision? Well, that's one of the bonus questions, too. I know right? we have our standard ones, but the bonus one talking about what if your clinical director is not a BCBA? So there's someone who just mm -hmm. said, I'm a venture capitalist. I hear this ABA stuff is big money. So now I'm running my company. They might have no clue about this, and they are not required to uphold the, the ethical code. Well, they're not, but they are, right? So they're not, but they're not because they're not a BCBA, but they are because they're running a behavior analytic agency, mm -hmm. right? So even though it doesn't sp specifically say in the code that, you know, like if you're doing, if you're providing behavior analytic services, you have to follow this code because it doesn't, although I wish it did, mm -hmm. right? It shouldn't just be RBTs, BCABAs, mm -hmm. and people in graduate programs. That seems silly. But I think that people that are running behavior analytic agencies should adhere to this code, right? And if she wants to keep Kimiko, who's awesome, I think she might have to hire someone else part time, you know. To mm -hmm. But so is there, Darren, what do you think? Is there an ethical responsibility if the boss is not a BC, the clinical director is not a BCBA to say, listen, Kimiko, you're either going to handle it or you're fired. And then, you know, I mean, long term, that might be a problem because you're going to get a rep is like, don't work for that company. They're going to overwork you. They're going to make you do unethical right. things. But in the short term, that doesn't help Kamiko because she's really at risk of losing her job. And, and losing your job is not a reason to not act ethically, though it certainly makes it a lot harder to do. Would there be any repercussion for that boss in terms of from – other organizations, you know, from funding sources, from, uh, you know, the, the BACB itself, you know, doing anything you know, about that? I, I don't think there would be. Potentially but I don't know. insurance companies, yeah. depending on what it says in their contract. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, if exactly. there there is an insurance, there are a few insurance companies that do require you to adhere to the BACB ethical code mm -hmm. per their contractual obligations for providing behavior analytic services. Yeah. I mean, I think it's important to point out, I mean, especially within the last several years or so, we have a lot more behavior analytic organizations who are being owned by individuals who aren't behavior analysts. And some of them are actually really fantastic. Of course, it, it's kind of, it'd be inappropriate to kind of lump all these organizations and say, oh, these, these are not run by BCBAs. That, <laughs> therefore, they must be, they must be a problem. They're only in it for the money. You know, of course, that could be the case with some, but there's plenty of organizations that are owned by BCBAs who you can lump into that same that same category. But I think the scenario where if it's, if the, the owner of the company is not a BCBA, you're right. They, they likely have, I guess, this, a, a responsibility in, in a sense to the ethics code, but they're not, for lack of a better term, beholden to the ethics code in the right. same way that their yeah. employees are. So it, it becomes this kind of interesting circumstance where you have an employee then having to go to their superior and provide, hopefully provide education is to that not only will you 
will you help us to be better at what we do, provide better care by following this code or helping us to adhere to this code, but you hopefully will even drum up some better business and you'll have a better reputation and, and your voice in the field will be a lot better if you let us do our job in the way or you listen to us as behavior analysts and our opinions. I, I think that would be ideally the circumstance, but it certainly could also be uncomfortable. I think the, the easy answer or advice to give to behavior analysts who are working at companies, either whether they're owned or not owned by behavior analysts, to say, well, if you see these things happening in your company, well, then you should just quit. You know, that might be the right <laughs> That's answer. That's my favorite one. Just but leave. it's not, yeah, it's not the easy answer because yeah. what if you can't? I mean, we're, we're, we're fortunately or unfortunately, I guess, depending on how you think about it, we're an in demand profession. There's more individuals who would benefit from our services than there are individuals who could provide that service. But that's not to say it's still an easy decision to give up a steady paycheck when you have to pay bills or when you eat. have ins- uh, health insurance or, or eat or, you know, maybe you want to take a vacation or two, right? Mm, so yeah. just having that answer of, well, if you don't like the organization you're working with, you should just quit. That might, that might be the choice you eventually make, but it might not be the, e- the easiest first decision. So perhaps having that discussion and, and hopefully the, the owner, uh, again, behavior analyst or not, is, is receptive to understanding how by having so many supervisees working with you or working under you, it's great, I guess, in a sense, in that it's great for the field. More people want to work within this field, more people to provide services. But that could also translate into poor supervision, which means maybe you're not getting as great clinicians going out there and, and having some letters after their name. Or because you're dedicating yourself so much from the supervisory aspect, maybe you're not able to dedicate your time to uh, the learners or the clients that you're working with. Mm-hmm. It's a balance that sometimes can be pretty hard to navigate. Yeah. I do appreciate that the next steps are often in these situations would be that sort of, uh, and, and Kamiko actually did in this scenario, that sort of try to attempt informal resolution, making known your commitment to the code. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I know the first time I read that, that scared the heck out of me because the idea of, all right, I tell someone in charge of me that there might be an ethical violation and I'd like it if they do something different, like, uh uh-oh, they're going to fire me right away. You know, it was very scary Mm -hmm, to think mm -hmm. about when I first Mm -hmm. started. But as I've been in the field long enough, it has resolved so many problems. Like a lot of times you go up to someone and say, listen, I just, and it's kind of an uncomfortable situation, but you lay out the scenario, you lay out the applicable (laughs) codes. Most people I've done that, the few times I've had to do that, have been very understanding. And they, oh, no, I completely understand. This is a complicated situation. You know, they've understood that there are a lot of factors and there are a lot mm-hmm. of potentials for harm. And they've been very helpful at coming up with a resolution. I, right. You don't you're go laughing in there. at me. You don't go in there, Rob, and say, go ahead, fire me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Rob does, well, though. You know, when I retell the story at like a dinner party, Depends it's always like, I went in there and I told my boss, you're going to do this. Or, <laughs> and they did it because I'm such an amazing person. No, and in real life, I usually am actually very like, well, you know, the code says, and I'm a little concerned. No, I'm actually surprisingly even, even keeled in my discussions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think that brings up a good point. I mean, it depends on how you approach the situation. If you go in and, and you kick open the door and you're saying, you're giving me too much. I love that. Well, de- you know, depending on your boss, they might they might not appreciate it. But if you Fling the ethics in a code way right that, in their face, you know, take this. <laughs> set it on fire. In front of them. They're, they're probably not going to go over too, too well. But if you do it in a, a way that's appropriate but also assertive, then – Ideally, it will be helpful to you. And if not, then that's very telling of what what your next steps yeah. might need to be. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'll speak for myself. I, you know, years back, I had a situation where I felt as though I, I had too much on my plate. And, and I went to the supervisor and basically had that type of discussion. And in that scenario, there were just other things, I think, like you all pointed out, there was just other things that I could have been doing to manage my time more effectively. Mm-hmm. So to me, it was a, a supervisory volume situation. But by going and approaching my, my boss at the time with my concerns, then we were able to sit down and have a pretty good collaborative discussion to say, okay, well, here's your volume. Here are some things that you're doing right now. Try these strategies to help yourself out. If it's still problematic, come back and talk to us. Mm-hmm. And, you know, with their advice and suggestions, I mean, I still sometimes felt overwhelmed, but, you know, I don't think anybody in this, if you're not feeling overwhelmed then in this field every once in a while, then, you know, you got to ask yourself what you're doing. But it it was it helped me to kind of get to a better solution that worked out more for me and and for them. Yeah. All right. So let's move on. Case seventy two under the influence, or as I like to call it, IBCBA better when I've had a few. Uh, <laughs> you can you know Darren, again you know you just I you just don't wanna... have to laugh at those. 
Uh, I, I, I realized as I did, I probably shouldn't. It's just uh, encouraging. He's, it, he's like tickling no himself. No borderline there, Rob. <laughs> he's, 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 he's tickling himself so he'll laugh when he when hey, you I, say I'm it. not a published writer. I can make up whatever crazy scenario names I like. Oh, <laughs> I have no ethical violations to the Writers Guild of America. I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> Carry on. Okay. Dear Dr. Darren. A few months ago, at my ABA-based agency, we had our annual BCBA party where alcohol was served. A few of the staff drank heavily, including my colleague, Nietzsche, a newly certified board-certified behavior analyst. She was pulled over by the police on the way home, arrested and charged with driving under the influence. That sucks. Mm -hmm. She should have driven faster. No, no. As part of her guilty plea, she had to pay a fine, participate in community service, and complete a DUI education class. When asked by me and her other colleagues if she reported anything to the BACB about the incident, Nietzsche stated that she did not. She said she felt it was already embarrassing enough, and because she told her agency about the DUI, she did not have to inform the BACB about something that happened out of the office. Sincerely, person who wrote this letter. All right. Ugh. I thought this Dear one was P the P most WTL. straightforward of, of all of them, which is nice. I think we already talked about integrity, 104, you know, all our integrity mm -hmm. related codes. That's certainly one of them. And then we're kind of getting into code 10, the code that I would guess if there were a number that most people skipped, it was either ones related to research because they don't do research or code 10 because it's at the end and you get tired reading a whole bunch of codes. <laughs> which which of the which of, uh, of 10 did you think were the most relevant to this case scenario, folks? Well... I think people forget that when even when you're not working, you're mm -hmm. still under the code, unfortunately. Right? So if you're doing something that is illegal, you do have to let the BACB know that you've done it. And they make the decision, right? So they w might tell you, okay, you might need to do extra things. And maybe when they, when they submit it to the BACB, okay, I got a DUI, I've done all these things, it, they might be, okay, get a little extra supervision and you'll be fine. But they they also may not do that. So, mm -hmm. uh, not reporting it is a is a violation of ten point zero two, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Even though it is embarrassing, right? Yeah, yeah. I know. I really feel for Nietzsche. I do too. What do you think, Darren? Do you agree? Yeah, I think I think you all are, are hitting it right there. I mean, I, my guess is the BACB doesn't really want to hear about all this or or, or <laughs> have too much invested in, in in these types of things. But you know. It, it's, it seems like it's not fair to have to share all this information and most of the information about our personal lives we don't have to share with mm -hmm. the BACB. But my, my guess at least is why uh, these types of legal challenges is something that we have an obligation to report is because at somewhere down the line, it could have some type of impact on our client. Right. So, which is why we then we then have to re report it. So, so yeah. So, ten point oh two, that timely reporting code, and then I think you also mentioned ten point oh six of just not knowing whether or not you had to report. It. I think yeah. those are two that are pretty pretty strongly apply. Yeah. One thing I love about this, when this code initially came out, like everybody was sending all their parking tickets <laughs> right. to the BACB, and like, oh my gosh, I got like a. Like a violation for, you know, like running a red light one time like 10 years ago. Uh, and then they had to send out the the newsletter being like, don't send us things that don't matter. <laughs> I mean, it does say any ticket or the does. behavior analyst is named. So you yep. would, your name so would be So everybody on did. So all those rule governed behavior analysts were sending in their parking tickets, their jaywalking violations. Uh, and right. then the BACB specified in the newsletter that it, it is if you are at your work and the client is in there, if there's a ticket over seven hundred and fifty dollars, which is a lot of money. It's I mean with speeding tickets though, you can get you can rack that up pretty okay. fast. If you like hit a school zone and you were going forty, I think you're Okay. Uh do I've do never that. done that, so I don't know. Said with specific detail. Right? I so. <laughs> you know, just... <laughs> and if it's He's if joking. it's a felony mm -hmm. and sure. or public yep. health and safety. So those you know, a DUI would be Regardless of whether you're with the client. Regardless of whether you're with a client. If we were the client, it's kind of worse. It's right? very bad, to oh, be yeah. honest. But if you're not with a client, even if you're just out having fun, you, you, you do need to report that. Yeah. The nice thing for Nietzsche is as long as it has been 30 days since she got that ticket, she hasn't at least added an ethical violation to her list of, of problems. Though, considering how much she had to do, it's probably been over 30 yeah, days at this point. Yeah, it sounds like it, but... But, you know, maybe it's 29 and she can just kind of squeak it in in the 30 days and at least avoid the time. ethical violation. 
uh, your, one of the later questions, does the agency hold any responsibility? And I, I don't actually know where the law is on that. Mm -hmm. I would say that they do in the sense of any agency that's serving alcohol at an agency function <coughs> should really be thinking ahead about what what am I doing here? I'm making it easier for my staff to drink and then I am not necessarily providing them the means to get home without being intoxicated or being under the influence and either I'm going to get Ubers for everybody and it's part of, you know, the holiday bonus is everyone I'm driving y'all home. So feel free to drink a little bit or uh, I'm not going to provide alcohol at this party or it's going to be limited to, you know, everyone gets like a drink ticket. So there's there's no chance of well, there's less chance that it would be uh, related. But I, I don't know what the whether there's an ethical quandary there so much as the business practice, I suppose, depends on who's in charge of the business, whether they're BCBAs or not. Even if they are, I don't know if there's an ethical violation so much as it's probably a bad idea. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I, I don't know if there's a, an ethical violation there or not. I'm, I'm certainly something from an HR perspective for the company to think about. And, and I think you gave some some good suggestions about how to how the company can approach it. It's, it's nice to be able to do things for your employees, you know, boost up morale, keep them working for you. We, we have a pretty good turnover rate when it comes to this field. So, so having these types of activities can be really fun and really nice. But then again, having that, asking yourself that next question of how do we want to approach this? Should this happen? I think ask yourself as the business owner, if this is going to be the plot of an episode of the office, you know, <laughs> am I doing the right thing? <laughs> All right, let's move on to our last scenario. And this is in the chapter about multiple complex ethical scenarios. So this is case 77, Social Media May Day. But that's actually the title, Social Media May Day? Yeah. That's a good title. I had unfriended, but I think yours is actually better, Darren. So don't don't worry about mine. I just was, you know, just I think I have another one that's uh, unfriend request. So that <laughs> nice. might, uh, that was good. All right. Dear Dr. Darren, Valentina is a BCBA and a member of several ABA-themed and autism spectrum disorder-themed Facebook groups. Often, people practicing behavior analysis or parents write into the groups either sharing their experiences or asking for thoughts and advice. Valentina noticed a post from Christy, a mother, asking for some advice about her two-year-old son. Christy explained that her son was displaying some, quote, odd behaviors, but she had not yet taken him for an evaluation or to her pediatrician. Several other members of the group who identified themselves as BCBAs, commented on the post. Some shamed Christy for not already having a diagnosis or enrolling her son in ABA-based intervention. Others told Christy that her son was, quote, definitely autistic, and others provided her with specific interventions to reduce the mentioned problem behaviors. My question is, how is everyone behaving ethically in this scenario? And then what is Valentina's responsibility? Thanks so much, <laughs> unnamed. <laughs> Oh, so this, I read this one, and my first response was, get off social media. Don't read any web pages about BACB and the BCBA, and you never have to worry about these kinds of problems again. So just put your head in the sand and run away from the computer <laughs> was the best answer, I thought. And then I said, well, that's not a great answer for everyone. So I went back, and I tried to think about it again. And the question I kept coming back to is, what is Valentina's responsibility mm -hmm. exactly? She's not a moderator, of this group she's just someone who's going to the group right she's just someone who's, who's mm -hmm. reading these posts does she know these people posting is she sure that they're bcbas is her responsibility to actually do more than just talk generally about the field and make sure that people aren't misrepresenting behavior analysis or is there actually like multiple violations going on by the other people posting who you know put bcba in their in their handles online so everyone knows who they're bcba by the way mm-hmm when I read this one, I was like, if the BACB wants to hire me to troll people on the internet <laughs> and look for people that are providing treatment advice when they're not under a specific contract to do so, and then I would mm -hmm. find their names. You're going to be like a narc. You're just going to be sitting yeah. there like online and like, <laughs> I'm going to post something inflammatory and see what someone I'm posts. I'm coming to get you. I'm trying to reel in some folks. <laughs> I've thought about You're this a lot, You're not going to have to though. look very far. No, no, but so if, if anyone from the BACB is listening and you want to hire me <laughs> on a part-time basis to troll the internet. Everyone, when you see um, Jackie, make sure she knows what a narc she is. Uh, I, I mean, yeah, right? Like, it's hard. This is like, a very real problem. It's so yep. real. And I also feel sometimes I'm like, I want to private message these people and be like, why are you telling her this? You don't mm -hmm. know anything about mm -hmm. her. Yep. You don't know anything about anything right now because it's the internet mm -hmm. and you can't see anything. And it makes me so angry that 
oh, I like literally I want to shake my fists in the air when I see this happen, which is why I think I would be the best at this job. Are we all pretty comfortable with folks giving free advice on the Internet? You're most you're, no you're, you're in violation of no, 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 no. <laughs> you're probably in violation. I was looking at like 212, you know, making sure you have you have a contract that is clearly defi- d- described. There's no like free consult involved. I, no. I think there's no informed consent about, hey, I posted a question online is not the same as now you've hired me to tell you what you're supposed to do next. Right. You don't know the person like you were saying, Jackie. You haven't conducted any sort of assessment. So that's uh, 301. You haven't done any sort of assessment. You're just throwing out random ideas like a shotgun approach. So in that regard, when you respond to people on social media, you are probably going to be violating at least those two. Mm -hmm. You're not involving your clients in the planning at that point, because as much as you can respond back and forth in social media, it's not the same as when you're sitting and talking with someone on the phone or in person. You're just throwing something online. You may never look at their response again because I just posted something real quick about, ah, your kid sounds autistic and yada, here's what you need to do and do this. And then I got busy and I never responded to this again. So so that's the, like 402. You're not uh, involving your clients, maybe even, you know, 405. You're not giving any level of description of what procedures you should be doing, though you shouldn't do that either, <laughs> really, because you shouldn't have been giving this level of consultation online. It's not an appropriate place to do that for the reasons we kind of already discussed. So those those would be the ones that I think everyone else is doing. So the, the folks who are responding to the parent, to Christy, right? But then I guess it brings us to Valentina. What's her responsibility in the situation? She didn't write anything. So those would not be codes I would I would remind her of. But then what's her responsibility to behavior analysis, to... Is there a responsibility to that pa- that poor parent who's kind of getting harangued online? I mean, I, I think there are codes that probably relate to it, though. It gets so murky because it's, you know, it's the internet, I right? Mean, and I and I think one of the things with this with this scenario too is, you know, in almost every other scenario that that we have in the book, if someone asks me, hey, is this one of those ones that you talk about that you know came from your experience? I usually won't answer that question because I want to make sure that I'm not going to give any clues about anything, mm-hmm. but. This is something that I see personally all the time. I mean, if you're involved in any of the social media groups, whether that be an ABA-related group or an autism-related group, if you're on that long enough, you're more than likely going to see something similar to this come up. And it's it's really problematic. It's really disturbing. I know that there's there's an article that, that you all have, have presented on a while back related to how to appropriately carry yourself within social media as, as a behavior analyst. But oftentimes, we still see, unfortunately, Legitimate BCBAs. So I know the question was, are these people really BCBAs or not? But legitimate BCBAs who are providing their opinion uh, without any established role to the person who's asking the question, who hasn't met the client or done any type of assessment. And sometimes they're saying some pretty disparaging and inappropriate things in their comments. And it's bad for the field. It's bad for the dissemination of the field. Those things, even if they get, get deleted, can can live online forever because who knows if someone's going to take a screenshot of it. So it just opens up the door to so many circumstances and situations. And and then the question then becomes, well, if you're the observer of this, I think you're right, is is, is what do you do? And I, I think, you know, if we think about the ethical violations or, or, or risk of harm from others in the 7, the code 7.02, we start to think about, well, ideally, I suppose that if we see something, we should say something. And whether that be you know, approaching the individuals or, or messaging, I guess, the individuals mm. who are who are making those comments and, and kind of just providing a little bit of respectful education, I guess, might be a way of saying that, or, or mes- messaging the moderator of the site to say, hey, I just wanted to let you know, you know, on this page, this is something that was that was mentioned, if, if this is something you would like to look into further. Um, but I know a lot of people are hesitant to do that, because it's, you know, it's calling people out. It's an uncomfortable thing to do. Who am I to say, who am I to bring this up? Maybe I'm wrong here. So it, it certainly becomes kind of a challenge for, for the observer as well as the, the person who's on the receiving end of all this information. Yeah. I, I like that idea of, of maybe talking to the moderator or the person in charge of the group, Darren, because I know one of the things that I, I'm always concerned about with social media, and I think one of the reasons I just, I do not take part in social media anymore is the volume becomes so high. So Valentine is watching this post and you've got like 30, 40, 50 people mm-hmm. saying, I'm a BCBA and here's what you need to do. Is it really Valentina's responsibility to right, message right. every single one of them, cut and paste, like, hey, everybody, I want you to refer back to the following ethics code to do that for every single person who posts. And then 
if she stops paying attention to the post, well, now that she's engaged in the post to the post itself or to the people involved, does she have to keep checking in on the post so that if people keep posting, she can add to them? You know, I think we'd all say that that's beyond her responsibility. Is, correct. But right. she's mm-hmm. already she's she's clearly acknowledged this is a violent ethic. You know, there isn't uh, I have a responsibility mm-hmm. to my field. But where does that responsibility end or begin? And I, I think that idea of, well, okay, who is on the internet? Who's sort of in charge of this sure. of this mm-hmm. piece? And that would be the person you'd probably who want to talk to. is in charge of the me. internet? Dr. Right. Internet is <laughs> the person who yeah. emails. That's me. <laughs> well, me. And, and to that, I've seen, I've seen people post on when things like this have happened on the different, you know, ABA-based or, or autism-based, I guess, social media sites. There, there perhaps has been one person who might have mentioned, Hey, to this parent, I just want to let you know, here's, maybe you want to seek out some local resources, but we shouldn't really be providing. And they maybe provide more of a, an appropriate informative statement. Uh, and then I've seen moderators get on and, and post something saying, Hey, just to let you know, everyone looking at our, our responsibilities, looking at our code or what have you, this is the most appropriate approach and how to handle this further. I so do like that. I, I think. Yeah, I, I think that's kind of because you're right. I mean, if you become the, the Internet police or, or the social media police, then you're not going to have time to do anything else. And it might not actually have any type of impact yeah. um, because these scenarios and situations, unfortunately, come up all the time. But I think having an eye for it and being able to identify what's appropriate or not when you do see them, I think in and of itself, that's an important, important skill set to have an important thing to look into. I mean, I just think back to being in college and like posting something simple, like, I don't think this video game was as good as I wanted to and having people be like, I'm going to kill you. How dare you say such a thing? <laughs> and so anytime I think about posting on the internet, I'm like, it, there's a chance mm-hmm. that I'm going to say, hey, everybody, don't forget, this is the ethical code and have them, you don't, what do you know? You don't know what you're talking about. I'm right. going to report you mm-hmm. to the BACB because you're harassing me and you're my free speech. And, and I would like to think, of course, our profession would never do that, but there are a lot of people and not every single person that you interact with will follow the code the way we would like them to. And as much as there has been some attention given to social media and the internet and our place in it, it's still not as concrete as many of our interactions with, you know, people in our day to day. Uh, So that would always be a concern. That's why I say don't do social media, everybody. Let's just all agree to not do it. That's, that's my, that's my pose. That's not a great idea, but it works for me. <laughs> Donna's shaking her head. She, I thought she was going to berate <laughs> well, me for a second. Well, I mean, that's fine for you, but I, there are a lot of people that are, are still going to be on there. Not cause, no, because Officer Jackie is going to be making sure she's cracking right. down on this. Reverend Dr. O- Officer Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, I mean, I, I see a lot of people giving out advice that is more more detailed than they really should be. Um, and then in this scenario, there's also people who are diagnosing the child based on right. the online <laughs> summary, mm-hmm. which is just, you know, several levels of uh, going way too far. We, as BCBAs, most of us cannot diagnose anyway, unless someone has an additional degree, such as yourself, Dr. Darren. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Regardless, you shouldn't be making those types of statements online. Anyway, so this scenario would be particularly egregious if you came across it on the internet. But I mean, every day I see something that comes across where someone's giving too much advice outside of the context of a proper contractual arrangement. And people who are posting the scenarios are often like this was a mom in this scenario. But I I often see scenarios where people are posting too much information about a client Mm -hmm. that could be identifying if you were to go to that person's like you can just click on their name and often see where they work, you know, and then they said, oh, I have a third grade student, blah, 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 yeah. you know, and like that immediately like narrows it down. If you mm-hmm. were to know that town, you might know that kid. Uh, and that to me is not OK. And I, I do see moderators, I think, working to address that. And that's maybe gotten a little bit better, but there's still way too much of this floating around on the Internet, yeah. um, which is outside of our ethical code. And it makes me feel very uncomfortable. Whew. Right. I think, I mean, one of the nice things or maybe not nice things, I guess, depending on how you think about it, of, of the Internet and the so- these social media pages is that you can kind of it can be a nice little warm security blanket for you where you can kind of toss out the things or the advice that you have. And then you have no impact on you, which is why we have these these codes related to our role and our responsibility and the expectation that we actually conduct some type of assessment before making recommendations, because it's very it'd be very easy to say, here's what you should try, or here's the diagnoses, or, you know, you're a bad person because you haven't taken these steps just yet, and then go about your life. But that can have some pretty big impact on the person that you're saying it to. Or even if you're a BCBA saying, hey, I have this client, I could use some help. Does anybody have any advice? 
I think it was the, the O'Leary or the blurred lines article where they talk yeah. about the response effort in doing that is so much less because you get this vast community giving you direction and help, which is in one way amazing and awesome, but in another, it could also open the door to just maybe number one, just not helpful information uh, or information that's just going to be completely counter to what you should be doing. Oh, boy. Ethics is hard, guys. I don't know about you, but... <laughs> but isn't it fun? Isn't it cool? It, you yeah. know what? When you, I, I think it is nice to have... I think that is one of the, also the positives of social media is it, it does make it easier if you're distant or you don't have a lot of BCBA friends mm-hmm. to like make come to your house and do your podcast with you. You have, <laughs> you have a means of actually <laughs> discussing these scenarios so you can read them and then say, I think this... But I'd love to hear other people's opinions of it, too. So so in, in that way, you know, that that is definitely a plus of having the Internet at your fingertips. Um, mm-hmm. But they probably should also, if they're interested, if, if, you, if you're a BCBA and you're interested in ethics and you want to keep practicing and honing your skill. Well, you got this great book and we only did. What was that? Five. Yeah. Five mm-hmm. scenarios. So there's like 80 more, 80 plus more scenarios mm-hmm. in the book that were all, a lot of them are fun and I think covered a, a surprising i don't know if you guys had like a chart of like which codes got covered by which scenario but i felt like every single one of them covered a couple different ones so it wasn't you know it wasn't a lot of the same so in that regard i, I felt like i was really getting a workout of thinking about what are the what's i never think of that scenario i never mm-hmm. think about that code and it Rob was like kind was of breaking pop- a sweat oh, oh, every time he was sweating <laughs> you can only do two a day because otherwise i'd you know pass out <laughs> have a swoon about the ethics code yeah i think these are great and they're not just for people who are to study to be a bcba these are highly relevant for people who are practicing as bcba so mm-hmm. I think it would be beneficial to like get together with a group and maybe you can meet in person, maybe meet virtually and you just go over some scenarios like we just did. Like this would be really impactful, I think, on people's actual practice. Oh, yeah. We added this to our it's on our supervision uh, going out in the next couple of months of some of the supervision where I work. And we said, you know what? We're going to add like one or two case scenarios at least mm-hmm. every month so that we just kind of keep going through for the for our supervisees to kind of keep them thinking because. It's a lot better than the old, well, uh, here's a scenario. Uh, this happened. Uh, what do you think? And it's, you know, really easy because when asked to come up with scenarios, I can't come up with anything complex without spending a lot of time <laughs> thinking about it. So it's nice that this resource is already there. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Uh, well, Darren, thank you so much for coming on the show, for going over, for, for Dr. Uh, Darrening with us, uh, dear Dr. Darrening <laughs> with us and uh, going over scenarios and, and, and making sure that we were on the right track with all of these. I know not everyone is going to be able to call you on your on your phone and, and, and make you tell them the correct answers. But if people do want to get in touch with you to kind of ask for clarification or to share their thoughts on any of the scenarios, do you have a, an email or contact that you would you would like to share? Sure, of course. So they can they can email me if that if that works out. So uh, they can email me directly at Darren at Dr. Darren Sush dot com, uh, Dr. Darren Sush dot com. And that, that'll get to me. And I, yeah, we'd love to hear about if they have any questions about the scenarios or just want to chat about them or, or feedback. You know, one of the things, probably the second that I, that we, that we finished with this book, immediately, almost immediately after there was, oh, well, this is a new, a new one we could add. And at some point we just had to say, no, 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 we have to, we have to stop. We have to stop doing this. <laughs> <laughs> so there's always situations that we face practicing in this field. And it's, it's really, it's a good thing. But I think having the opportunity to, to think about them critically and, and discuss them helps us to be better practitioners, better, uh, more prepared for ourselves and, and a better representation for the field. Oh, yeah. So you might have a sequel coming out someday because it sounds like you already have a few more, a few more in mind, but not, not, not right now. They, this is the book. Well, now I have to now. do the choose your own adventure first. Yeah, and right. Then I, right. I, I can't wait. To help you. I cannot wait. It makes sure some of them are really silly too. I would appreciate that. It's like you turn. <laughs> I would follow Code Ten. It's like, ooh, sorry, leprechauns. What can I say? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh boy. So, uh, Darren, if people are interested in in purchasing the book, is there a place that they should they should go to first? Sure. I, uh, so, so if you look it up on Amazon, it's it, it's right there for you. That that might be the easiest, or or through the publisher site, Elsevier. I would love to say wherever fine books are sold, but that's just that's just not true. Um, <laughs> so going through the publisher of uh, Elsevier or uh, Amazon would probably be the quickest way to get it. Darren, thank you so much. We went really long with you, so we really, really are, are so oh, no, appreciative you. of your time that you go over all the scenarios with us, and it was a lot of fun. Well, this was great. Thank Good. you so much. Well, I hope everyone enjoyed listening to our discussion of these five exciting case scenarios with Dr. Sush. We've got 
so well, we don't have them they're in the book there's so many more case scenarios i mean we do have them in the sense that we own a copy of the book so we can read them at any time and like we talked about you too can get a copy of this book on amazon or the elsevier website certainly i know we really loved reading through so many of them it's a great exercise you could do with your colleagues but you know hopefully you enjoyed listening to at least the first five yeah or you can come up with your own we're not saying you have to buy the book. no 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 no, no. you certainly can come up with your own but i know you know, like we talked about with poor Kamiko, one of the supervision tasks you might want to, you know, time management is, did somebody else already write like a whole bunch of ethical scenarios that I don't have to make up on my own? But hey, if you like making them up or they're ones that are relevant to where you are, put them down. Keep, get them for your supervisees. Use your own personal experience and the code. That's right. That's all you need in your imagination. All right. Well, we hope you enjoyed listening to our show. If you're interested in applying for CEs, I'm going to give you your second secret code word now, and it is stone s-t-o-n-e stone like a it's a rock it's another word for rock or you know you could build a house out of a stone or uh, no yeah a stone or you bridges it's probably the strongest house really holds up against wolf breathing uh yeah stone highly recommend that's the bricks it's bricks bricks are stones but the word is stone yeah they're in the they're in the same category we hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of ABA Inside Track. Why not subscribe to the show? Maybe leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you like to listen to your podcast. You certainly can also feel free to find us online, wherever we're on social media as ABA Inside Track, Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram. We have these episodes go up uh, in podcast players, but also on the YouTube page with the YouTube subtitling feature. And of course, you can find them on the website, abainsidetrack.com. And if you are so inclined to write us with any feedback or thoughts, please do do so at aba inside track at gmail.com we'll be back next week with another full length episode of the show but until then keep responding bye 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 bye, bye.